let's take a look at some cat brain anatomy. Uh, how I prefer to get the brain out of the cranial cavity is actually through the roof of the mouth. Uh, I found it's a lot easier. You get a lot less damage to the brain itself rather than the traditional go through the top of the skull uh, with a saw and things like that. Uh, students tend to struggle with that a little bit more. So I actually follow, if you crack open the cat jaw, I just follow that line with the saw um, back to the base of the skull and cut it off and then basically go with the clippers and cut through the soft palate, uh, get around to where the ears are and the, all of those things. Um, actually I can do a good job in harvesting the, the cat brain that way. I'll also, in this case, you're going to find that the, the brain itself, I've taken out the, the maxilla and the palatine bones and all that. So you'll actually see the, the eyes in place and then the nerves as they come out of the nose and everything else. And I'll remove those as, uh, so you can see them as the students would see them from their harvesting. So here we go with the cat brain. This is a little bit different view than what a lot of people would find with the brain because I have kept um, the, the eyes and the nerves, optic nerves and everything else. Right here is where we would find the nose. Uh, you have the nasal bones that come down and divide in there. I'll be pulling those uh, off and give you a view of what the students would typically see when they harvest. Uh, this takes a little bit more time to do, but I thought it would be kind of neat to see some things um, in place. I'm going to flip this upside down and the reason I kept this, it looks like a mess right here, but the reason I kept this is so you can see there are a bunch of uh, blood vessels obviously, but you can see where the true optic nerves will be following here and cross right here. So you can see the optic chiasma as it goes right there, or optic chiasm. Here's the other optic nerve as we go here. It's going to work its way down. Obviously there are going to be a bunch of muscles. In fact you can see the little tendons here that will tie to that and uh, be responsible for moving those. I haven't cut those away either. The optic nerve comes down here and forms a little X. Now you can see also the olfactory nerves as they come down here and you'll see the lobe. Now this brain looks a little pale in color. The reason for that is it has a fine membrane over the top. This membrane is actually kind of a tough membrane and I like to use that description because it's the term for this literally means tough mother. This is a tough mother of a membrane that covers up the brain. I'm going to remove it, cut it away. And you want to be real careful as you do this so you can see the underlying brain tissue. This is my little plug for the movie saw where they cut into the brain and do a little surgery. Good job guys I'm doing that. It's pretty good science. I don't know if I would use my own hand drill or tools out of the hardware store to do it, but at least it looked pretty realistic. Now this tough mother membrane, the dura mater is there obviously to protect the brain, to seal it off inside. It's also a bacteria fighter. Um, bacteria have a tough time, no pun intended, getting through this membrane. Now you'll notice that this membrane actually goes down into the hemispheres of the brain as well. So students have to be really careful when cutting through there because they can quite easily damage the brain. It'll go down through the hemispheres separating off and compartmentalizing each of the lobes. Now most often they'll peel this off right with the skull as they're removing. Now we get down to the cerebellum we're also going to see it's compartmentalized, so they need to be careful, otherwise they're going to pull their brain apart. It's very soft tissue, very easy to damage. It'll actually wrap around, and you'll see that this will all come off in one sheet. Now as it does, most often what happens is 
the olfactory lobes will come off with it. And I fully expect that to happen. So this is the view that most students will have. Now, you'll notice also the optic nerves will start coming off with it. So you can see all of these things are being protected by the dura mater. Now, you can see some blood vessels in there. Okay, that means that tells us that we're in the arachnoid space. There's actually another layer right on the brain itself. We've uh, taken off the tough dura mater. There's actually another layer right here of the arachnoid layer. This is the layer in which we have the blood vessels. Now, the brain itself doesn't have any nerve or pain receptors, I should say. Obviously, it's a brain, so it's going to have nerve receptors. But it doesn't have pain receptors. So a headache actually is not the brain hurting. What it is is a problem with blood vessels and things like that. In fact, most pain relievers are actually just meant to alleviate problems with blood vessels swelling up too much. Well, let's take a look at some of the structures of the brain. Um, this is just a general overview. We're not going to go into specifics uh, with different regions of the lobes and things like that. But here is the typical uh, cat brain. It's very similar to what the human would have. We've got the frontal lobe. Okay. We've got right and left hemispheres. This is going to be the left hemisphere. This is going to be the right hemisphere. And you'll notice that there, the brain is convoluted. It has these ridges. In fact, there's one more layer right here underneath the arachnoid space and that's called the pia mater. Pia means little. There's a little membrane, and I'm not going to waste time in, in cutting those, but there is a little membrane that covers the surface of the brain itself. So you can see that this brain, as it's convoluted, actually has three dimensions to it. The high points of this convolution, all of these ridges up on top of the hill, these are the gyrus. And down in the valleys and these low points down in here, these are the sulcus or the sulci. Okay, so high points are the gyrus, low points are the sulcus. We've got the cerebrum. Now the cerebrum is there for obviously learning, for conscious thought, for uh, social judgment and things like that. If I flip it over on this, we're going to see where the olfactory lobes were. Okay, so this is the olfactory bulb as it comes in. We had the optic, remember the eye lived right here and right here. These optic nerves will come down and form an X right here and right here. Okay, that's the optic chiasm where these nerves will actually cross. Where they're going is to the back of the brain, um, to the back of the frontal lobe of the brain. We also see a little bit of the pituitary gland. Okay. The hypophysis is another name for that. That's the pituitary gland. And a lot of times that's going to come off like this. Now underneath, we'll find where the mammillary body is. Mammillary body, the, I should back up, the, the hypophysis or the pituitary gland is there for most of the more complex uh, hormone secretions. But underneath, we'll find the mammillary body, which is for more primal functions, for more homeostasis problems. Uh, we've got other lobes, but these are all frontal. Here's where we find the back part of the brain. It's called the cerebellum, and this will lead out to the brain stem. Now, the cerebellum is there for more uh, coordination and balance organization. I can actually lift this down a little bit so you can see the midbrain region, and we'll take a look at those and functions of the midbrain uh, later on. But that's going to be more primitive functions, a lot of hormone secretion. If I flip this over, okay, and again the orientation, we have the frontal lobe, we have the olfactory, we have the optic chiasm, now I've taken the hypothesis away so we're going to see where the mammillary body would sit. These right here by definition would be the brain stem, right, the pointer. And basically if I were to follow it down this way, it becomes almost a horizontal type of structure. This region right here, notice I said region, not specific structure. This region right here is going to be the pons region. Okay, as we work our way back here, it's more almost rectangular. This is the reticular activating system. The pons sits right on top. 
the reticular activating system would be right here. Reticular activating system is going to be more uh, structured for a filter. We used to think that the brain would be like a sponge or, or things like that. Um, actually what we have is the reticular activating system decides for the brain what to process. It's all the stimulus coming into the brain at once. What is important? What needs to be thought about? What just needs to be dealt with? Uh, what do we need? How do we need to react? And so on. Reticular activating system is a strong part of that and the pons is the distributing center. Sends it on its way, where it needs to go, what part of the brain, what it basically needs to, once it gets past the reticular activating system, which decides let it in, the information into the brain, the pond says, okay, where do we need to send this to respond properly?